All right. Thanks so much, folks. Can everyone hear me okay? Volume's okay? Awesome. Thank you for the thumbs up. Um, yeah, so what do we mean when we say inter, uh, measurement and why does it matter for security? Let's get into it. So often when people say security research, like when I'm like, oh, I work in security as a researcher, they're like, oh, you must work in threat intel. No. Pen tester? No. Okay, but surely you're a reverse engineer. It's like, no. I work in this other field called internet measurement or evidence-based research. And what I'm hoping is that you folks leave this talk with an understanding of what it is, some examples, and that when you hear the term security research, you think of more than just those first three pillars. But before I can get into some examples, I think it would behoove us to set the stage and talk about what is measurement. At a very broad level, measurement is a way to quantify the world around us with the goal to better it. And the thing is that the security field is actually fairly nascent. I mean, I know it's only been around for like two or three decades, um, but that's still pretty new. There are other fields that have been using measurement at the core of their science and their principles for far longer. For example, I know folks who have figured out ways to measure depression and cognitive well-being in adolescence using measurement. Um, there's been some amazing work, as many of us are aware, with our masks on, um, on the public stage about how to measure COVID-19 spread and how to mitigate it. Um, and then also you can use measurement in physics to see how, what is the polarization of light particles. So measurement is prevalent all around us. It's been around for a long time. It's used in all these different fields. And internet measurement specifically is about quantifying and improving the many parts of the internet, including the security aspects. And the nice thing about internet measurement is that uh, it can contain a lot of different facets. You know, we can measure server and server behaviors. We can measure people, like what are they doing? Or we can measure other people, um, like the attackers who are trying to break into servers. And so there's a lot of different facets when I think about internet measurements. So I'm going to concretize this a little bit with three examples. What are three ways that we can actually use internet measurement to improve security. And so in my own work, I've um, asked myself, you know, how do we measure attacker behavior in the hack for hire market? How do we compare our results to ground truth when you're an internet wide scanning engine? And also in the context of a SOC or an SOC, how do we improve vulnerability notifications um, within an SOC? And the cool thing about internet measurement is that like, yes, there's science and yes, we're trying to do like really valid work. But when I think of internet measurement, I think of it as a proxy to answer these overarching strategy questions to try and help better the world. And so really, when I say, how do we measure attacker behavior in the hack for hire market? I'm actually thinking, what defenses can we build in email to better protect targeted users? When I think about how do we compare our results to ground truth, really what I'm asking is, how could our scanning encompass more breadth and depth and be more useful to users? And then finally, when I'm thinking about how do we improve vulnerability notifications, it's not just about the notifications. In fact, it's how do we reduce the attack surface of an IT organization by removing these vulnerabilities? And so just a quick uh, break to answer why you should listen to me for the next 30 minutes. Um, my name is Ariane. I currently work as a senior security researcher at Census. Um, but previously, I did my PhD at UCSD, where my thesis was focused on, you guessed it, internet measurement and security decisions. And so all of the projects that I'm going to talk about are projects that I've worked in pretty directly. And I chose these three because they're very different. So my goal is to just give you a, a very broad range of what internet measurement can actually be. And so I'm going to dive into it by jumping into this first project. You know, how do we measure attacker behavior in the hack for hire market with the overarching goal to figure out what defenses we can build to better protect users? And so as many of you know, um, email accounts are super rich in information, which makes them super lucrative attack targets. And defenses have made large scale attacks difficult. Defenses like two factor authentication, spam filtering, and um, uh, security questions like, what are your hopes and dreams? Um, but targeted attacks still remain an issue, and that's because the economics in targeted attacks is very different. Instead of sending 100,000 emails and hoping that like 10 people click it, you are spending, as the attacker, a lot more time um, to cultivate a targeted attack, a targeted message, with the hopes that there is a higher payout. And usually when we think of targeted attacks, we think of high profile targets, like politicians, celebrities. You can tell these slides are kind of old because uh, the most recent news article is John Podesta. Um, 
But the reality is that at the time of this study, um, and actually it still exists today, there is this underground market that provides hacking services for hire. So this is an example of one of the advertisements. It's essentially a hacking group that purports to break into any Yandex, Rambler, or Gmail account that you want to get broken into for anywhere from 100 to 300 US dollars. Um, and this hack for hire market had not yet been examined. But the reality is that 100 to 400 US dollars is actually pretty reasonable for a lot of us if we've been jilted by an ex-boss, an ex-partner, etc. And so me and my colleagues had set out to answer this question, specifically these three main questions. How many services can we find? How sophisticated are the methods of attack? And how widely used are these services? Again, with the overarching goal to figure out what better defenses can we build? I do want to um, make a quick note that this entire study was done with Gmail because we were collaborating with some folks who worked on the anti-abuse team at Google. But as you'll see, the results can generalize uh, pretty well. And so to give a quick overview before I jump into the specifics, the way that this process worked is we discovered these services that purported to break into Gmail accounts. We then created online personas as the buyer and the victim in order to engage with the accounts because like, I didn't want to give out my personal info. Um, so I just made a bunch of online personas. We then engaged with the service as the buyer persona saying like, hey, we want to hire you um, for this victim. Again, both the buyer and victim are completely fake. Um, we then monitored the attacks from a, a variety of different vantage points. And if, we were, if they were successful, we'd deliver payment because they did what they said they were going to do. Uh, so some people made money out of this study. <laughs> um, I do want to dive really quickly into the buyer and victim personas because this is, this is, there's some important details here that'll make sense when I talk about the results. So like I said, I didn't want to use my own email. It'll also be weird if I just kept being like, I have... 20 people that I'm really mad about. Please hack into all of their accounts. So instead, every service that we reached out to, we had made a buyer and a victim persona. And the buyer persona, we just made a Gmail address with you know some believable name like Ariana Mirian, some numbers at gmail.com, but not actually my name. Um, the victim persona was a little bit more intricate. And that's because one of the things that we had hypothesized is that in these more targeted attacks, these attackers would take facets of this online digital footprint that a lot of us have and utilize it in the attack vector. But we didn't know what they would use. So we were like, we're just going to make as much of a digital footprint as we reasonably can. And so the victim persona had a Gmail address, again, that was like some generic first, last name, numbers. Um, they had an online web page where they purportedly worked or owned. So I made a lot of small business owners. Um, and in the web page, we linked the Gmail address. We also made additional Gmail addresses that were their associates that were also linked on the web page. So like in one of the cases, uh, I remember the victim was a, a man in this, like he owned a carpet cleaning website or a carpet cleaning service with his wife and they owned it and there was this whole backstory. I got really good at this. Um, <laughs> we also made a Facebook page for <laughs> these victims and then we um, set up SMS 2FA on all of the Gmail addresses. And this was specifically because at the time, and I, I don't know what the statistics are now, but at the time SMS 2FA was the most widely used form of 2 two-factor authentication. And so we were like, we not only want to see if they can um, create a convincing attack, but if they can also bypass what is the most effective second form of authentication at the time of this study. And so, you know, the first question we wanted to answer is how many services could we find? Um, we looked at a bunch of underground forums. We reached out to a number of our contacts at various abuse, um, anti-abuse team, <laughs> abuse teams, anti-abuse teams <laughs> at tech companies. Overall, we found uh, 27 services and we reached out to all of them. 10 of them never responded to us for reasons I could hypothesize. I don't really know for sure. Um, 12 of them responded to us, They're like initially, like, yeah, we're totally going to have into this account for you but then made no attempt um, three of them were scams so they like you know purported that they broke into the account um, but we didn't see any indicators of compromise we didn't see any like logs or uh, uh, like Gmail logs that anyone had gotten into the account um, and my favorite scam was this and I regret that I don't have the GIF um, so 
I put in the email address and then I just watched this web page for three minutes as it told me that it was hacking into my Gmail account. And there was also a button to speed it up and you could pay them more money to go faster. They did not break in. I lost like 250 bucks on this. Um, it was really entertaining though. Really cool thing about doing academic research is that you can do a lot of crazy shit and then someone pays for it. And it's like, all right, well, that's great. Um, but that means that there were five of the 27 that made an attempt. And so for the rest of this portion of my talk, I'm going to focus on those five because that's, that's where we had results. Um, how sophisticated are the methods of attack? We never observed any brute force logins. We never observed any communication with the Facebook account. And we also never observed any communication with the associate. So we set up all these facets of the digital footprint. And a lot of them just like weren't really utilized in the attack. Um, all of the five services sent an email to the victim. And in one of these services, the email contained a malware executable that wouldn't run. This was like the one time in my life I really wanted to get owned. We tried on a bunch of different laptops, a bunch of different VMs. It was just, it was just broken. Um, we uploaded it to VirusTotal, which said that it was probably a remote access Trojan, which for those that aren't aware, um, it's basically a piece of malware that records what you're doing on your computer, including typing what, uh, including recording what you're typing into gmail.com. Um, but that means that four of the five services you used phishing in their attacks, um, but they used very, very good phishing. Um, like when I said that they use phishing, these were incredibly targeted, highly crafted um, messages. And this next graph that I'm going to show you, well, let's just walk through it. Um, this next graph that I, is on the page shows that these phishing attacks were persistent and personalized. So I know there's a lot happening. Just focus on that top row for now, because I'm going to walk you through what this graph is actually saying. So the letter is the service, which we've anonymized for privacy concerns. So like service A and the first time that we hired them, um, each of the dots represents an email that they sent our victim account. And so you can see across all the rows, they sent, in most cases, multiple emails. And then the color denotes what sort of phishing lure or what sort of, um, what sort of bait they were trying to use to get us to click on it. And so light blue means that uh, they use personal details. And when I mean personal details, I mean they use details from the web page that we set up in the phishing emails for this fake person that doesn't exist. So there is no way they could have crafted these emails unless they had Googled that Gmail address and had found that web page and then crafted an email that was spoofed to look like my wife at my carpet cleaning service. Um, which was actually one of the emails. Um, you also see on the legend that there, is a, there were different types of lures that were used. You know, some of them purported to be like a Google login. Some of them purported to be a government. Um, but these attacks were persistent. So when we didn't click, they just kept sending more. And they were also personalized. And this was a pretty big finding for us. It's like it wasn't a one and done sort of thing. They were putting in the work. Um, they were trying multiple emails um, to try and get in. The X's is where we clicked on the emails because I was like, I want to know how they get in. Um, so these targeted attacks, the TLDRs, that these targeted attacks were able to bypass two-factor authentication in their flow. So I would click on the email. It would take me, you know, the email would be whatever lore. Um, it would take me to a Gmail sign-in page that was actually not Gmail, but it was a domain that looked really close to Gmail. I would put in the password for the victim account. And then most of these um, services accounted for the fact that there was 2FA protecting the account. And so the next web page was actually, again, a prompt that looked like Gmail saying, hey, we just sent you a text to your phone. Could you please provide us that 2FA code? Um, the phishing attempts that did not anticipate 2FA, so I put in my password and then it just like 404 4 they adapted. In other words, they sent more emails later that then accounted for 2FA in that phishing flow asking for the code. Um, and in fact, one of the services doubled the price when they realized that 2FA was protecting the account. Like they came back to me as the buyer and were like, there's, there's some more going on here. We need, we need $500. And I was like, all right, it's fine. We paid them. We paid all of them. <laughs> um, the other, so, so this is an overview of like what was the level of sophistication for these attacks, right? Um, the other question that we were interested in answering is, you know, how widely used are these services? Because we 
had a very narrow view. We could hire them, we could see what methods of attack they were using. It wasn't any sort of fancy zero day, it was just really sophisticated phishing, um, spear phishing. But we wanted to know how widely used are these services, and this is where partnering with folks on the Google anti-abuse team really came um, in handy because they could look at the logins from the Gmail side. They could create fingerprints because a lot of these ended up looking like phishing kits because they were very fast and um, how quickly they were responding to us typing in the password in the 2FA code. And then they could look and see how many real Gmail accounts had been logged in with these fingerprints. And so this graph shows from March to October of 2019 um, how many actual Gmail accounts had been logged into. Um, and so it's fairly small. I mean, the y-axis only goes up to 35. These are unique accounts. But there's still hundreds of people affected by these services. And this is a lower bound because this is people um, these are actual Gmail accounts that had a successful login with this fingerprint, not an attempted login. And so there could be hundreds more victims who saw it um, and were like, oh, that email looks weird. I'm not going to respond to that. Um, in tandem with this research study, Gmail introduced a couple new defenses that helped protect against this attack, which we call man-in-the-middle phishing. Um, and... That's one of the measurement studies. So at the end of the day, we were trying to figure out you know, what defenses can we build to better protect targeted users. The measurement question underneath it was, how do we measure attacker behavior in this really niche market? And in the process, we found that the attackers are not as sophisticated as we had hypothesized. Um, and we also found an effective defense for this attack that was then deployed um, on a major email provider. So this is one example of a measurement, internet measurement study to help security for good. I'm going to change tracks a little bit and now talk about some work that I did at Census more recently. Um, the measurement question was, how do we compare our results to ground truth? And the overarching strategy question that I was attempting to answer is, how could our scanning encompass more breadth than depth? It may be more useful to users. Um, those of you who were in my talk yesterday are probably like, wow, this is deja vu. You are only talking about good data quality. We love good data quality. This is a lot of what I think about. Um, so just a quick primer sense, this is the one place to understand everything on the internet. It's an internet-wide scanning engine that um, we do all the scanning, and then you can access the data. So you don't have to have your own servers. You don't need to like have your own setup. Um, for those who aren't as familiar with internet-wide scanning, I don't really have time to dive into it. But it, we essentially provide a map of the internet. So like you know how Santa goes to every house and drops off gifts? Um, the analogy here is that Santa is going around to all the network devices in the world, knocking on all of the doors and being like, hey, what do you speak? And what, what are you willing to tell me? OK, bye. And then runs away to the next device. Um, and so we do a lot of scanning to see like what's on the internet, um, what are these devices willing to tell us, what services do they speak, et cetera. And we have this interesting question, which is a lot of people consider census ground truth. But how do we quantify accuracy of ground truth when we are considered the ground truth? Um, and like I said, I think about data quality a lot. And so we came up with this experiment, which is we're going to compare census to Nmap. So Nmap is like the OG internet scanner. It's from the 90s. Um, it's still around. You can still use it. I still use it. It's great. Um, and so we were like, OK, we're going to take a set of hosts. We're going to scan them with Nmap. And then we're going to also compare census results um, to an in-the-moment Nmap scan to see where things differ. The scanners are different, but we were like, this will at least give us a starting point to be like, what are we missing, if anything? Um, because we want to grow and change. And so this is essentially what I just explained. Um, and this diagram, I think, shows a little bit better what we're trying to do. It's like, take the census data, take the Nmap data. Where's the overlap? Where's the exclusion? Um, how can we improve? And so we ran this, and we found that you know, between census and Nmap, we found an 87% overlap, um, which is pretty good. There were 13% of hosts or services that census found, but Nmap did not. So I'm going to just, we can call these false positives, but like it's comparing ground truth to ground truth. So that um, is maybe a little bit uh, of a misnomer. Um, and then we found about 5% of things where census did not find it, but Nmap did. And so, of course, whenever I see results, I'm like, well, let me go validate and do some manual digging to see what the heck is going on. And in a lot of these cases, the discrepancies were because we were seeing these hosts that would be online. You know, we'd do like an in-the-moment Nmap scan, and they'd be online, um, and then they'd disappear like a couple hours later. Um, 
only to come back. And Census is an internet-wide scanning engine, right? So we're scanning pretty consistently, but we're not scanning like every 30 minutes or like every in the moment. Um, and so this actually brought up this really interesting question, which I, I want to share because a lot of work with internet measurement is kind of taking a step back and being like, why is this happening? Um, or what are we measuring the right thing? Like, is this flapping behavior, is, are these differences a facet of the differences in the scanner or just because of timing? Because, you know, as an internet wide search engine, we have churn, we have databases. We're not just going to like run a one off Nmap scan. And so, as with many moments in my life, I was forced to take a step back and ask, are we even measuring the right thing? And so, we actually ran the experiment again. But instead of comparing the Nmap scanner to the census API results, which is what we were originally doing, we, com we compared the scanners to each other. And so we said, OK, we're going to take the same set of hosts. We're going to scan them at the same time across the two different boxes and examine the differences. Um, and then again, we saw like about 86% of the time the results were the same. Um, in this experiment, we found that census was able to find about 10% of services that Nmap did not. And at this point, we're like, we're doing a head-to-head -head comparison. So we're going to go and manually verify this 10%. And when we did, it actually turned out that these were all services that we scan better. Like, for example, TCP SIP is very complicated. It's very funky on the internet. And the Nmap scanner does well, but we have additional logic to account for a lot of these weird edge cases on the internet. So when I say we went and manually verified, I mean we really dug in. And we're like, OK, there's a lot of these instances in the 10%, like the majority of the 10%, where we have just written code that accounts for more of the weirdness on the internet. But then we found that Nmap found 4% then our scanner did not. And this was the place of growth and improvement and a place for us to to continue growing as an internet-wide scanning engine. But like I said, one of the things we realized in this study is that these hosts, some of these are just like going up and down. So we had this real now what moment. Because <laughs> we were like, ah. One of the difficulties is that census data is not an in the moment scan. There is going to be a little bit of lag. And there's a lot that happens on the internet. So these hosts that are very ephemeral, that are online for one scan, but then all of a sudden offline for another scan, we're not just going to churn them out immediately. Actually, we want to go and like double check our work and make sure that they're still there or they're still not there, and that we're not doing all this churn for no reason. And so as, you know, as a team, we were like, what can we do to convey to the public that there are these instances where we're like, hey, we saw this thing. And now it's no longer online, so we're going to go do some double checking just to make sure. Um, how, in other words, how do we convey these instances where we think a specific host is no longer present, but we're doing these additional checks to make sure that is actually down and there's not like a network blip somewhere on the like 20 pads on the internet? And so as a result, we actually exposed this field. You can see it right now. It's called pending removal since. Um, and this is an example of how it shows up in the data. Um, and it literally just says, hey, we think this host is no longer online, but we're doing our sanity checks. But as of 2024, 04, 05, 26, and then some other timestamp, um, we haven't really seen a positive scan. So we're doing, we're doing our due diligence. The other thing that was interesting is that when we went back to our original results, right, where we compared the Nmap scanner to the Census API, and we said, OK, let's go and see if we check how many of those hosts had pending removal since set. In other words, we think they're probably down. How does our false positive change rate drop? Or how, did, how does the false positive rate change? And it drops from 13% to 5.5%. So like the majority of those cases where we see something but Nmap didn't, actually we had received a negative scan. We just hadn't turned it out of the database yet. And by exposing this flag, we are providing more transparency to everyone who's using the data. If we also account for the protocols that we know Stances can scan better, the, the false positive rate drops even more. And so this is an example of a very different experiment where I basically just kept digging but as a result, we re-examined what metrics of comparison we should actually be using for this pretty tricky question. And then also, how do we expose these intricacies of timing externally? 
As a result, also, this project prompted a totally different project, which I presented on yesterday, um, where we scan the internet every 45 minutes and are now analyzing those trends to try and better our scanning data. So a lot of interesting stuff here. With my last 15, 10, 15 minutes, I'm yet again going to switch topics and talk about a completely different internet measurement project. So first, we talked about measuring attacker behavior. We then talked about how do you compare ground truth for an internet-wide scanning engine. And now I'm going to talk about some work that I did when I worked as a security researcher at the IT org at UCSD, um, where we wanted to improve our vulnerability notifications, but really we wanted to reduce the attack surface of an IT organization, um, specifically UCSD's IT organization. And this was an interesting partnership, because I actually was doing this while I um, I was in this role jointly while I was doing my PhD. And it was prompted because the IT org was like, we want to do better. We want to reduce our attack surface. But things are pretty abysmal. So what should we do? And we were like, hey, can we run a measurement with you? And they were thrilled. So that's what we ended up doing with them. So just for some background, as I've done with the other two, um, a lot of organizations have moved their infrastructure to the cloud. But there's a lot of legacy organizations, like a large academic institution, that has physical machines on premise that are still maintained by a multitude of different admins. And in an ideal world, you have people who are updating the machines constantly so that they don't have vulnerabilities that are exposed to the public. And the reality is that these disparate physical systems can um, have vulnerabilities. They are not patched at consistent rates. And they can also affect the safety posture of an organization. Because all of a sudden, you have all these different vulnerabilities that are exposed that an attacker can then use to get into the network, get into the system, wreak havoc. And so patching is not a new problem. This actually has a really rich history. But yet, it persists. And there's been a lot of advents uh, that have been created um, that have tried to make patching an easier process. A lot of them are optimized for the machine. But instead, we wanted to take a very different approach. We said, what if we tune the process, fine tune the process for the human? What if we took the process and the current technologies that are employed and examine holistically how, to make the, how do we make this process easier for the people, not only for the machines? And this is a little bit of a different mentality um, than a lot of related work that I had seen in this space. Like a lot of places are like, oh yeah, just like set up pager duty, do this, do this, do this. And it's like, well, what if you have an org that is 30,000 people um, and those 30,000 people are all running different experiments. They all have their different hardware setups and they also all have their own admins who are not talking to each other. So as with any good project, the first question that we had to ask is, what isn't working so far? And so like I said, we had teamed up with the IT security team at UCSD. And the, the lead security engineer who was um, in charge of this endeavor had been sending out these emails. And I was like, hey, what are the emails that you're sending out to these admins that no one is responding to? And so this is an example. All the, um, oh, all the private information has not been redacted. Um, yeah. <laughs> Whoops, hang on. <laughs> well, I need to show you this email. That's awkward. You want to pull out the ACMI real quick? Yeah, I am. This is literally recorded. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, my bad. Sorry, folks. Live editing. <laughs> I had to redo um, these slides from a different slide deck, and some of the things did not get copied correctly. OK, great. Do the thing. No. <laughs> Sorry for the snafu, folks. I also found out I was giving this talk yesterday. So that's why I had to alter some slides real fast. Um, OK, we're back on track. This is the email that he had been sending out to um, the admins that were within the um, IT org. And like I said, a lot of these people work in different groups. They're just all under this umbrella broadly of IT. Um, and so you can see, you know, there's a couple things that immediately stood out to me with this email. 
The first is that um, this was basically just a laundry list, right? It would say, hey, here are your SEV4, your SEV5 vulnerabilities. Here are the hosts that they're on. You need to go log in to um, Qualys and figure out what the vulnerabilities are to go patch. And also, you need to patch them ASAP. Um, thanks. And you know, looking at this and thinking about the human in the loop, right? This email didn't list the vulnerabilities. It just said, go figure it out. Here's the number. Good luck. Um, it didn't list any additional details. It required sysadmins to perform extra steps to get the necessary information. Like they had to log into Qualys, which as we found out later, a lot of the people didn't have access to Qualys. So they'd click on the link to log in and they wouldn't have access. So they would just give up and be like, oh, I got the email again. Guess I'm not going to do anything. And at the end of the day, this added a lot of friction in order to execute, right? Because if anyone has done any sort of sysadmining, you know, everything, so, not everything, things are constantly on fire. And then you're getting told by the IT security team, hey, also, you've got to go fix these 10 vulnerabilities. Good luck uh, to a system that you don't have access to. So we reviewed some related work and basically just employed some pretty basic behavioral science principles, right? It's like instead of asking people to do all this additional work, what if we just laid it out for them as simply as possible? And so this is the new email that we had started to send out to them. Some things that I want to point out um, is that we every email only focused on one family of vulnerabilities. So this one focuses on Windows. We say how to patch, and we would put instructions for different versions, different distros, if that was applicable. Um, we would would link to various resource articles. And then also, um, which you can't see in this email, there would be an attached CSV that listed out all the details from Qualys for them directly. So they didn't need to go log in anywhere. Instead, they could see like what is the CVE, what's the vol name, what's the IP, et cetera, et cetera, all this metadata. So we started sending these. And then the, the question was, did the patch rate change? Did anything happen? So we created this automatic pipeline to analyze the data um, to see, you know, like during the old email and during the new email, what was the patch rate for different contacts, volumes, and different times of the month? And we found in aggregate the patch rate increased from 3% to 78%, which was huge. That was like a huge difference. People went from basically doing nothing to actually reading the emails and doing something. But of course, I work in measurements, so my question was, why is it only at 78%? Why is this not 100? I'm giving you instructions that I painstakingly wrote out. And so we analyzed the data in a couple different facets, and we found some interesting trends. The first is that some of the contexts were just much better at patching than others. There were some groups, some admins, who were at 100%. There were some who were a little bit lower. So the average was 78, but this was that there were actually some pretty disparate distributions when we looked at the groups and the contacts we were sending to. Um, certain Vaughn families just get patched more. Um, patching something like Chrome, is a lot easier than patching something like your Linux distro. And we saw that in the data, where isolated applications were getting patched at much faster rates than something like your operating system, um, which makes sense. It's more of a pain. And then some Vuln families uh, just take more time to patch. And this was kind of the, the second part of that takeaway. And so at this point, we actually did something that was like, a little new for me. Um, instead of just looking at data, we went and we talked to people. So we conducted semi-structured interviews with many of these sysadmins. They were anonymized to add a qualitative view to the quantitative data, right? Like we had all these hypotheses. And instead, we just went to them and asked, why? Like, why are you not patching this over that? How do you feel about these emails? Um, and the reason that I say semi-structured is because we had a list of questions. And if you've ever done academic research, you need to like, get your questions approved by this thing called the IRB. Um, but we also learned a lot of fascinating tidbits when we just let people talk and listen to what they said. Um, in particular, when we asked about the old email, we saw three main trends. The first is that the monotonicity of the old email made it really easy to ignore. That email looked the same every single week. Every week, it just said, go log into Qualys and check out what's vulnerable. And people straight up told us it was really easy to ignore, so they just started ignoring it. Um, we also found out that many teams have exceptions. Like They're like, oh, I'm told by my manager that I'm not supposed to update these four different programs. 
So I just ignored it. It's like, oh, we were not aware of that as the security team. Uh, that's interesting. Um, and then we also found that a lot of these notifications fall outside of their patch cycle. Um, so a lot of these teams have set times that they're going to update specific applications, specific programs. So they'd see the email, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to get to Red Hat in two weeks. Why would I listen to this email right now? Um, Overall, we found really positive sentiment towards the new notification, but we also found room for improvement and better integration. Like I said, the fact that a lot of these teams were like, yeah, I have exceptions, and I've been filling out this Google form with all of my exceptions. Don't you get the exceptions was news to the entire security team. And so that was a huge disconnect that has um, since been remediated that we wouldn't have found out if we had just looked at the data. We needed to go talk to people to find out that there were some random Google form that they were filling out and they thought they were exempt from patching. Um, yeah, I know, it was, it was wild. Um, so we not only improved the process, but we uncovered systemic differences in infrastructure. We figured out what are the right metrics. And to my knowledge, um, these emails are continuing to be sent out and people are continuing to patch at UCSD. So this is the third project, right? So in the process of trying to figure out how can we reduce the attack surface of an IT organization that's pretty spread out, um, we increased the patch rate significantly, and we also found these major discrepancies in systems and organizations that could then be remediated. Um, and that was a pretty huge finding for us. Um, oh, it's 3.38. OK, great. So let's just recap. I went over three very, very different projects that, in my opinion, all fall under the umbrella of internet measurement. The first one, we looked at attacker behavior because we wanted to figure out what defenses we could build. The second, we looked at internet-wide scanning data and compared it to other scan data to figure out how we could get better. And then in the third, we did a mixed method study to improve vulnerability notifications and specifically vulnerability remediation at a pretty spread out IT organization. And so what I'm hoping you folks take away is that like internet measurement is a tool for security research, but you can also employ this in your own organizations, in your own um, situations. And so for example, you know, one totally different area that I don't work in is hate and harassment. So you know, how can we measure hate and harassment on online platforms to better think about defenses to protect targeted users? I think about the user a lot. I think we're all people at the end of the day. Um, the, this project that I had talked about yesterday, you know, how ephemeral our hosts are ports on the internet to better understand how do we alter our scanning to have even more up-to-date data for users. Or you could go totally different direction and say, what trends exist in leaked data such that we can better understand how do we help journalists democratize knowledge about what's happening in the world via that leaked data. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can think about measurement. You can think about it quantitatively. You can think about qualitatively. And what I hope that you've learned from this talk is that internet measurement is about quantifying and improving the many parts of the internet, including security. And it can be a tool for everyone. So with that, I want to thank you folks for your time. Um, I think we have some time for questions. We can also follow up with me after on any of these handles, and I'd be happy to chat. Thank you so much. Oh my God, stop. Christian and I used to work together. He's just trying to hype me up. <laughs> All right. OK, uh, second question. Uh, you you kind of mentioned this earlier, and you were talking about how measurement is relatively new in the cybersecurity space. And you talked about these other pillars, you know, if you're threat hunting, pen testing, all these other things. How much do you think we can learn from Internet, internet measurement and collecting and quantifying that data and using it to run experiments to gain better understanding. How do we take that out of internet measurement and take it to threat hunting and other things to be a lot more evidence-based? I mean, in my opinion, I, I don't know if you share this, we make a lot of decisions about what we should do and what defenses we should put into place and uh, what products we should buy, and there's no evidence that they're efficacious or that one product works superior to the other outside of a vendor deck, which you can't trust. Yeah. So 
how do we take a lot of what you just shown us, which is objective measurement, good quality data, science, and apply it to the other parts of cybersecurity? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think that's really hard to answer. Um, <laughs> the, the short answer is by taking a step back and thinking more about holistic approaches. And so like often when I think about threat hunting or threat intel, for example, we're thinking about very specific use cases or like a very specific actor. And one way to think about, you know, how do we bring internet measurement to that realm is like, okay, well, like, what is the spread of this actor? Who are they affecting? How much are they affecting? What does that look like over time? And so I think one way to, to start merging all these fields, because I agree, I think it's very useful, is thinking more holistically. So like, instead of just in this time, in this moment, in this specific actor, how do I generalize? How do I take a step back and take a, a more global, uh, holistic view? Does that answer your question? Thanks. Uh, so this is sort of a generic question that comes to my mind whenever I'm looking at my log files. Is it an issue for you guys uh, where people uh, view what you're doing as being hostile, uh, where you hit honeypots, where you hit firewalls that start blocking you, where people, you know, try and hack back or complain to your ISP? Is that, is that like just a little noise that doesn't matter? Or is it part of what you have to deal with, you know, when you're doing these measurements? Yeah, just to make sure I understand correctly, you're a little muffled, I apologize. Are, is the question, you know, like, how do you deal with, um, like, honeypots on the internet, people scanning back, hacking back? Correct. Okay. Along with, uh, like, there are tools that will throw up drop rules and honey, and you know what I'm talking about, drop rules yep, and yep, firewalls yep. as soon as they see you scanning. And then 15 minutes later, the rule goes away. Yeah. So uh, how do you measure, and again, you know, is that just so small that it doesn't matter? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so how do we, I, I guess the, the overarching question is like, how do we deal with all these facets on the internet that make internet scanning hard, like honeypots, firewalls, things going up and down, et cetera? Um, the first, you know, I guess the base answer to that question is like understanding what can go wrong and then trying to quantify that. So like in census, we actually do label to the best of our knowledge, honeypots, tar pits, et cetera, because we know those things exist. So then we can go and do, you know, more fingerprinting research to say, hey, what are the most popular honeypots? What do they look like on the internet? What do they look like in our data set? And then how do we label that such that other people aren't deceived as well? Um, so that's one facet of your question. How do we deal with firewalls that go up and down? Honestly, constantly scanning, changing our scanning. Um, looking for new things and comparing it to older parts of our data set and then recognizing like, oh, this thing is actually really new. Let's continue to dig in further. But I think at the base, it's having a deep understanding of the field itself. And this maybe goes to the other question. It's like understanding in networking on the internet, what are the things that could go wrong? What are the things that could exist? And then how do you account for that in your measurements, in your scanning, et cetera? Does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hi, great presentation, nice to meet you. I would like to say that I follow the work that is held at UCSD, mostly with the network telescope that they operate over there. Um, so I, I would like to ask you if there is an intersection between the UCSD telescope and the work that you perform currently. So it's mostly a cu curiosity. Is there any other work that's coming out of the network telescope? Yeah, if there is an intersection between the, the style of research that you conduct, the measurements that you conduct, and this, the, the, the knowledge that you acquired that could be potentially related to this telescope at the university. Yeah, so I mean, I think they're, they're very highly related. I mean, I consider a network telescope to be a, a measurement tool in and of itself. For yeah. folks that don't know, a network telescope is essentially like a, a block of IP addresses that isn't sending out information, it is just receiving. And so it's essentially like a, um, like a, a, a box to receive information, see like what are people sending organically on the internet with no interference, right? Because like if we send a scan, then someone might scan us back because they're like, what the hell are you doing on my network? Yeah. But like this, this block, this network telescope doesn't do anything. So yeah, I think they're very highly related. Um, 
And it's, it's essentially just another tool, right? Like if we think about census, census is active scanning. So like we're sending out probes, we're seeing what information comes back. Um, a network telescope is a little bit more passive, right? It's, Absolutely. it's listening and seeing what's happening on the internet. And then like you said, there's a lot of really interesting trends and research that can come out of it because you're just organically listening to what's going on. Yeah. F finally, I just would like to share that I have this, what is becoming a cloud telescope. So I'm reproducing the method that is used in a physically bound network telescope such as UCSD, but deploying the same approach in AWS to see how busy Senses is at scanning the devices yeah. and also other internet scanners. So it's quite interesting to see this pattern, this shifting in terms of behavior of what's, uh, what's currently going on on the internet as well. Just sharing. Yeah, okay, thank you so thanks. much. I love the mask. What mask? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So um, I wanted to ask if you could share a little bit more about how you were configuring NMAP wh when you were doing your comparisons between the census scanner and the NMAP scanner. I think that you mentioned that one of the areas that census was excelling in was SIP uh, and you know, SIP ports, because yes, SIP is a lot. Yeah, just hand waves. <laughs> so I was, I was wondering if you were using uh, like the, the NSA the, uh, sorry, the NSE uh, SIP scripts yes. as well and comparing that to... Yeah, we okay. did a number of different tests. Like we did like bare bones NMAP. We used the NSE scripts. We tried like um, dropping anything with UDP because like UDP gets a little funky um, with like filtered results. Um, and even when we tried the NSE scripts, we still found a, a better improvement with census. Do you provide any feedback to NMAP about any of that or, or are they considered a little bit too much of a competitor? Oh, we haven't provided any feedback, um, but not because of any, not for any reason besides time, to be quite honest. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that I can explore separately. Um, there's just always things to be do. doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Great presentation. Thank um, you. I thought that the uh, going through and recrafting the patching email was very cool. Like uh, to be able to like just take a different a view on it to get people to respond to it and actually fix the, the patching was great. My, my follow up on that, my question is like, for the people that said that they had exceptions previously, did you follow that down the risk side of things to like figure out how people got exceptions? Were they real exceptions? Like tying it back into like a, like a, a risk register type system. Like was that something yeah. you guys did? I'm sorry. I, it, I'm having a hard time hearing what, what okay. were you saying? <laughs> it's just hard with his mask. No, I think this, like, I don't think I can hear the speaker. Um, oh, okay. So just like um, for the people that said, for this, okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm okay. just. Got it, okay, very cool. Um, for the people that came back and said, uh, I had an exception already. Oh, yes. You went down that, did you go down that path back to like a risk register? Like, cause a lot of times we find people say that as well. And that's how we find out that our risk register process is broken. The approvals for that is broken. No one follows up on that. Like they, they never expire. So. Yeah, that more my question. Like, did you go further that way on it? Yeah, so we, we did examine for the people. Um, the, the question was, you know, for the folks who said they had an exception, did we dig into that further? Um, we did it. So after the semi structured interview, we followed up with them and we're like, hey, what are you talking about? Right. And that's when we found out they were like, oh, there's this Google form that I thought was going to the security team. And we were like, we don't own this. Where did this come from? And so that was when I handed it off to the, the, the security engineers. And, and they chased it down and, and clarified some things. And, and this actually led to um, a bigger takeaway for UCSD IT, which is that because there's like so many different organizations who just have their own people, yeah. there's a, a break in communication. Um, and so there were some organizational changes that were made to try and facilitate better communication. But yeah, we didn't have like any risk registration or anything. It was, I think what had happened in that case is that someone who had previously been on the team years ago yep. had set that up because, you know, you understand that there are exceptions to the rule and then that had just never been handed off correctly. So using a process to better another process. Like I exactly. I took over USB access approval recently and now we're seeing all the breaks in IT that we didn't know existed that we didn't know until we started seeing the requests. Yeah. So like, it's just like, I, I always, it always excites me to see like one process bettering things, making another one better. So very cool. Thank, thank you. you, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, hi, my name is Chris. Uh, great talk, thank you for that. So you might have covered this 
before I walked in. I was walked in a couple minutes late. No worries. But for those of us who are aspiring researchers and would love to get more into research, what are some pathways that you could share on ways we could get in? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, one of the things that is super cool about the internet today is that there's a lot of accessible public data sets. And so actually this last question, like what it trends exist in leaked data, was in part motivated because I had gone to a talk where, um, oh man, I'm blanking on his name, the guy who used to, hmm, I'm not even going to try to remember. This really famous journalist who was at The Intercept was like, yeah, there's all these data sets online, but like I don't necessarily have the data skills to go and dig into it. And so like I pair up with researchers, and then they tell me all the cool, interesting stuff, and then I write about it. And so I think one thing that you could start to do is just look at some of these public data sets, like even public data sets that are used in tutorials, um, just to get an understanding for the tools and how they're used, and then go and apply them to like leaked privacy data sets. Um, more other trends or other ways, um, you know, uh, like I got into research by working with a research lab in an academic org. Um, that was my path, but I think there's a lot of different ways and that's just two of them. Oh, very cool. And I didn't even think about working with uh, journalists on when you have a discovery, maybe share it and yeah. get the word out. Yeah, I would say, you know, there was a really interesting talk. Man, I can't believe I forgot his name. Michael Lee? Is that right? I don't know. Micah Lee just yes. put, put out a book, Hack, Leaks, and Revelations. Yes. That talks all about the data sets and you work That's on. the book, Micah Lee's book. This is where I was like, wow, there's actually a lot of, thank you for that. There's a lot of public information, public data sets now. Um, but like pairing up with someone who might not necessarily have that background but has the interesting questions, if you can bring the data science skills to the table and you can pair up together, I think that's also a really good way to get your toes wet. Very cool. Thank you for the, the name drop. Thank yeah. You. yeah, yeah. thank you for reminding. There was a neuron working really hard to try to remember. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I, I'm terrible with names, but uh, I just saw he's going to be doing a book signing at DEF CON. Oh, nice. So that's why it was in my head. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I was going to say, I think we're at time. You folks, feel free to come find me, and thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it.